in view of what our Lord has borne that we might have our sins remitted and be able to be reconciled to him, to be a child of God, to have the hope of your eternal life, then the very, very least we can do is to be faithful to him according to the teaching of the New Testament. A part of such faithfulness being that we are soldiers of the Lord. One of the most pernicious threats against the Lord's church is our, meaning Christians, members of it, lack of militancy. We just don't hear that talked about. Not like the Bible talks about it. When we think of militancy, we may be thinking of people burning down houses and rioting in the streets. Of course, I don't have that in mind. Our warfare is not carnal. And yet, Paul will talk about the Christian's fight of faith and how he's fought the good fight, tells Timothy to be a good soldier, talks about the armor, which we'll mention later, that was like to the Roman soldier's armor but if ever the Lord's army needs to rise up each individual one of us collectively to stand up for Jesus Christ then it's nowadays it is always I recognize but especially when we have situations like this people will talk about the attack that was made upon the nation of Israel yesterday and surprise attack, all these different things, even as, as they did in 9-11 or as they did with the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor and other such like things. But if we can see the need for vigilance when you're surrounded by enemies, and our adversary is the devil and all those who serve him, then surely we realize that the Lord's church, the army of the Lord, is engaged in an all-out war. All too often on the part of members of the church, there's no longer a, a show of aggressiveness in waging war against the forces of error and wickedness. We can see how that a strong secular nation to keep its freedom, should be strong militarily. But seemingly the kingdom of the Lord and the citizens thereof think that you can whip sin with a feather. Well, I can't find anything like that in the New Testament of the Christ. I've heard virtually all my preaching career coming from people that should have known better that they were and are pleading for soft words and inoffensive sermons all in the name of love. Well, I don't believe the Lord ever said or did anything out of anything but love. I would like to know that I take a position that the Lord did anything acting out of love. That is, he was acting contrary to love the appeal for a non-aggression pact with the devil will render the Lord's church as it's defined and appears on the pages of the New Testament impotent and simply nullify our reason for existing I don't know how many members of the church can see that when it comes to a secular nation and carnal warfare but they're blind as a bat when it comes to the Lord's church as the army of the Lord. And each member of the church is a soldier of the cross. I don't know how they justify themselves and probably don't do it much of singing the old song onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. 
But the apostle Paul called for all-out open warfare. Listen to what he said to the young preacher Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. This charge I commit to thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Now this is the same apostle who's inspired of the Holy Spirit to write the great love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. He is the apostle, one of them, of the Christ who said that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son who taught that we ought to love God with all we are and all we have and love our neighbors ourselves. Now those passages don't contradict one another. It's the nature of the warfare of the Christian that we don't seem to understand. We've got to the point to where we don't want to offend anybody. We actually feel bad when we offend people for the truth's sake. Listen, 1 Timothy 6, 12. A plain, bold, forthright statement. Fight the good fight of faith. Too many who have been called into active service in the army of the Lord are simply seeking appeasement and non-aggression with the enemy. They literally think they can convert people without them being brought to face the sins that have separated between them and their God. They're saturated, many of the church, with the notion that the Spirit of Christ leads only to peace and mildness and diplomacy and tact. They think that an all-out war against all error and every wickedness is simply incompatible with the Spirit of of Christ. And in taking those positions, they prove themselves to be so ignorant of the scriptures. How they know so little about our Lord's attitude toward error and false teachers. Listen to Jesus. Think not that I'm come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be those of his own household. Matthew 10, 34 through 36. When we're trying to form the mind of Christ in ourselves, when we're trying to go out and teach others, must we not be prepared to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and all that that means, Romans 1.16? Whenever our Lord walked in Palestine, you find that there was a disturbance that followed in his wake. The waters were rolled and brought up like a boiling cauldron where they had been calm. He stirred things up. He awakened people out of their lethargy. He awakened them from their sleep. They were not the same after they made contact with him. That should be the way it is with us as members of his spiritual body, the church. Many were deeply offended regarding him. I can't find him apolog apologizing anywhere. Even among those closest to him, the disciples, he said things that pretty well, I guess you'd say, skint the hide off of them sometimes. No life of ease and refinement was promised by Jesus. We don't have a right to 
offer that ease and refinement to one who is going to become a Christian, considering or is a Christian. He never did. Notice Hebrews 2 and verse 10. For it became him, and then come on down, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. We do not like to suffer. We can talk about the sufferings of Christ and the sufferings of Paul and the sufferings of the prophets. We can see where the Bible talks about that all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We can read all of those passages that pronounces a blessing on those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And yet we still try to figure out a way not to have to suffer and at the same time be faithful to Christ. Notice what he said to the people of his day in his earthly ministry, of course. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time comes that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. John 16 and verse 2. And of course, if you consider the first great persecution that arose after the death of Stephen, uh, that's exactly what Saul of Tarsus was leading. He intended to stamp out the church. Then upon being converted and all that conversion means, Paul fully understood the nature of this calling and he turned right around to the opposite direction. Listen to what he said. Speaking to Timothy, Thou therefore endure hardness. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Second Timothy 2, 3 through 4. Now I want to pause right now and say if you've kept up anything since yesterday and in Israel, and again, I put no spiritual connection to the modern state of Israel. I just simply look upon them as a modern state, like I would the Ukraine or the United States or the United Kingdom or whatever. But they must be vigilant. Today, I promise you, they are walking on eggshells because it can come from any direction. Well, the children of God in the house of God, the Lord's church, the army of the Lord, are in the same position when we have Satan who is a roaring lion goeth about seeking whom he may devour. We have the same thing. And yet we don't consider it that way. We, we must lay aside the white gloves and niceties to be able to engage in this fray. This is a moral combat against a ruthless enemy. I speak of the fight of faith that the army of the Lord, the Lord's church, must engage in in order to be faithful. And we can see it in a secular nation. A no man's land will not be found in the conflict of which I speak. Jesus plainly declared, he that is not with me is against me. Matthew 12, 30. There's no middle ground. We who have decided to become Christians and all that that means, we have chosen to enlist in the army of the Lord to spend our lives in fighting the good fight of faith. There can be no compromise and there can be no quarter given. You will look at the life of Paul the Apostle and you'll see he never flinched in this struggle. Listen, he said, So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. 1 Corinthians 9, 26. He knew what he was doing. He knew how to fight the fight that he was called upon to engage in. He wasn't shadow boxing, is what he's saying. He was engaged in an all-out open warfare. Later he would write in 2 Timothy 4, 7, 
I have fought the good fight. We should be able to say as we have lived faithful to God down through the years, whether a brief period of time or a long time, that I fought the good fight. Well, some of them don't even know war has been declared. They don't even know there's an enemy. But they think they're converted to Christ to their own God's side. Jesus gave the marching orders to carry the fight to this world. How did he do it? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. Mark 16, 15. That's how he did it. That's the Lord's great commission as Mark records it. Because the gospel is God's power to save. Romans 1, 16. That's why he says, for I'm not ashamed of it. It's the only thing that could save anybody. And it dare not be deluded. And yet some of my brethren over the years have been the deluders. If that's a new word, then it expresses it right well. This means the church of God must aggressively confront all error. And it must triumph by living and proclaiming and defending the truth of God's word. We cannot accept a defensive position. We dare not capitulate to the enemy in a non-aggression pact. You don't do anything but surrender to the devil. The very reason for our existence is to suppress error and uphold the truth. There's no other reason for your being what you are if you're a true Christian is to suppress error, to expose it, to overcome it, wherever it's found, and to uphold the truth of God's Word. The Bible simply says the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15 We are members of that church. We are the ones to uphold that truth. And listen, if the members of the church do not uphold the truth of the New Testament of Christ, who is? If in your daily walk of life, around the people you're around all the time, do not stand up for what's right, who's going to do it? I remember Brother Bill Jackson, the late Brother Bill Jackson, who was a captain, in the Marine Corps, and he was in the Korean War. He was telling about a colonel. Of course, you know, they fought from hill to hill over there. They'd take a hill, lose it, and have to take it again, the way that war was fought. But many times they were overrun or nearly overrun by the Chinese when they came into the conflict. And there was a certain hill, and the colonel was there who was over the people, on that hill and he was told over the phone you must hold your position he said I don't have but a few men and the voice came back from the officer over him he said you're there aren't you sometimes we're ready to fight when there's a whole host but it's another story when we're the only one standing between the loss of something and whether it's gained or not. But all I simply do is call your mind back to David, the whole of Israel's army there, king included. Why must they wait on one person like David to do what any one of them could have done through great faith in God? There's no off-white shade for truth. There's a definite line of demarcation between the gospel of Jesus Christ and every false doctrine of men. The soldier of the cross must militantly guard the boundary. I have seen all my life as a preacher, even back as a teenager when I started, some of those who were my friends then say, well, what's the big deal about that? What's the big deal about that? Well, we all recognize if you have a wooden structure, 
that termites, as small as they are, if allowed to go on doing what termites do, they undermine the whole thing. One teeny weeny bite at a time, they bring the whole thing down. And that's the same way it is with any false doctrine. If you let one false doctrine go, oh, it's just a little thing. Then what's the next one? And the next one? And the next one? And you begin to build a psychology in your thinking. Well, that's not so bad. Why should I be upset over here with this person? He's a good guy. And so the devil worms his way in. And his henchmen have a heyday in the Lord's church as they've been doing for a long time now. From the very first... The soldiers of Christ, members of the church of Christ, waged an open, all-out war against error and wickedness. Peter carried uh, the attack, if you please, to the enemy. In the first recorded gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2, when the Lord established his church, he confronted that great crowd in Jerusalem. And do you realize what kind of courage it took him to declare, looking at them only days removed from the time they cried out of Christ, crucify him, crucify him. But he says to them, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain the Son of God. Now I can think of a number of brethren some I've known quite well over the years, who have said, he just shouldn't have said that. And they don't realize that what they're saying is they know better than God, and there's the problem. Peter wasn't courting the favor of the world by openly denouncing these wicked acts of those very devout religious people But it had its effect. Listen, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2, 12, verse 41. You can't prick the hearts of people with a feather tickling their earlobe. You just can't do it. The very idea of pricking something I mean, you feel it. We've all been pricked in the finger with a needle or a pin or a thorn or something, and we draw back. It's, it's, it can be pretty painful. There was no softness in Peter's message, neither the message of the rest of the apostles. It was a call to repentance. Men have to be brought to face the fact you have sinned, you did it, you enjoyed it, you consigned yourself to hell if you die this way. Now what are you going to do about it except obey the gospel? There's nothing wrong with saying God stands ready to forgive you. But only when you receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Only when you're willing to listen to God. We mentioned in Isaiah this morning, and it will be true of any of the prophets of old, the people were not willing to listen to God's prophets of that day. And spiritual Israel all too often walks in the steps of fleshly Israel. Peter was waging open warfare against infidelity. Now a little later on we find that he was beaten, he was imprisoned. He was charged never to speak the name of Christ again. Do you know the answer to that? He paid no attention to it. There was no retreat. I remember somebody saying, and I don't remember now where it came from, but they were surrounded, and the man said, good. We've got a front on all sides. All we have to do is go forward and attack. <laughs> we don't have to worry about God forsaking us if we love him and obey him. Even if we're put to death for doing what's right, Jesus has told us not to fear. We cannot but speak 
the things which we have seen and heard, Peter said in Acts 4 and verse 20. Well, we can't speak the things we see and heard. We're not witnesses to the resurrected Lord, but we can speak the gospel, which is a witness. You fill Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us, the leader said in Acts 5 and verse 28. Yes, they did. They did say, you killed him. You did it. And every Jew at that time that obeyed the gospel had to repent of that action, their part in it. So this was militant aggression, and this is what I mean. And I make no apology for it, and they didn't. And we must not. One of the benefits one gets of studying the early move to restore ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity back in the early 19th century is the open wide open warfare that those brethren early on made against denominationalism. Now you can read some of the stuff they did if you go back to Alexander Campbell's first publication which was called The Christian Baptist and you can read a lot of it then when you go into the latter and more numerous uh, volume The Millennial Harbinger. But he pulled no punches against the denominationalists of his time. You would do well to read about what those brethren in 1810 and 20 and 30 underwent as they sought to return to the Bible. The Bible only is their only rule of faith and practice to obtain the unity for which Christ prayed in John 17 and Paul commanded 1 Corinthians 1.10 and to show that the Lord's church is not a denomination, that to accept denominationalism is to accept that which is not taught in the Bible. And to be a part of it is to be a part of Satan's teaching. And they were wide open with it. Well, it just so happens that the people they were dealing with believed that they should have the Bible supporting them because they too believed the Bible was the Word of God. And debates were all through the 19th century. Many, many people obeyed the gospel because they were dealt with. We just don't like anybody to say you're wrong and here's how I know it and you must change. That's contrary to the way people teach you how to act if you're going to try to settle disputes around people. You'll find today that these, um, what are they called, where they try to hire them into big companies to settle disputes. Anyway, they got schools for that now conflict resolution have you ever studied some of that gook what it does let's say there's two people who are totally opposed to one another they do not begin by saying well what's right here and let's both come together on the right they try to say like this well I'm sure you've made mistakes and you've made mistakes we all make mistakes let's all just agree to disagree and be more tolerant of one another and go on from here and so everything becomes that which is just a matter of opinion and uh, human weakness and all that. Well, I grant you that there's that exists. But that wasn't the problem on the day of Pentecost when the Lord founded his church and the preaching that was done there by Peter and the other apostles. Those Jews on that day stood condemned and if they died, they're losing their soul. A serious business. And if we're not going to be in the fight, the way we're studying it now from the scriptures, we stand condemned. When you observe the Lord's Supper this morning, where's your mind going to be when you partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine? The bread represents the body of our Lord that he willingly laid down and allowed to be crucified and offered as a sacrifice. And the blood represents what he shed to purchase the church to cleanse our sins. And then we sit by and wonder, well, I don't know what's happening. I just can't figure out what's happening. And we talk to one another and we lament it, but what about those people out and around us? What do we say to them? Do we say anything that upsets them in the sense, 
would make them question where they're headed. The warfare which the Christian wages is not carnal. I hope we understand that by now. It's not akin to the warfare that's going on over there in Israel today or over in the Ukraine. Paul explained it in this way. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mightily through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. Many, many years ago, when I was asked as a younger preacher to speak to young people at times, I would say to them, You think that uh, Christianity presents no challenge to you? And then I would take this passage and others like it and say, You decide that today. You're not going to think in any way whatsoever but the way the New Testament tells you to think. You decide today that you're going to act in every way like the New Testament teaches you to act. And then you tell me that there's no challenge. It's the greatest challenge we face. Ours must be a spiritual militancy. And we confront religious error and moral error in our own lives first. And then we go forth to confront it in the world with the gospel of Christ. Just a look at our armor and our weapon should enlighten us to the kind of war that must be fought and will be fought by the faithful. Listen to what he said by Paul to the Ephesians. Something I must do and every Christian must do. You can't do it for me. Put on the whole armor of God that you may able to be able to stand against all the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. We oppose false philosophies that guide the wicked of this world. We oppose doctrines that condone immorality. We oppose philosophies that uphold ways contrary in whatever way it may be to the teaching of the scriptures. Our fight is against spiritual wickedness. And we must oppose that which opposes truth and righteousness. It's part of standing up for what's right. It's part of letting Christ be formed in you. Now, I won't try to read all these directly from the scriptures, but study carefully Ephesians 6, 13 through 16. Because here's the armor of the Lord that each one of us must put on if we would go to heaven. Now, I want you to think about that. It's not, you don't have an option here. If you're going to be faithful to God and do what God says you ought to do as a soldier of the cross, a member of the church, then you must put this armor on. Notice that the loins are to be girded with truth. The breastplate of righteousness. Well, all God's commandments are righteousness. Psalms 119, verse 172. The feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel. And the shield of faith serves to protect against the fiery darts of the wicked. Then there's the helmet of salvation, completes our defense. Now he described what a Roman legionnaire's armor was. Did you notice there is only one offensive weapon? The sword of the spirit which is the word of God. An examination of the armor and the weapon defines the very nature of the warfare in which our God expects us to engage. If we have become proficient in the use of that which is furnished to us in the word, there's no doubt we can win. We can win the battle. And we do so to the glory of God 
and present the victory to our captain, the captain of our salvation. We stand truly furnished unto every good work, as Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17. And we need to press the battle, doing it by the authority of Christ. And we must never allow the enemy to force us into a defensive position. One of the things I've noticed over the years about a great many, even some preachers, the first time they're opposed, they, they almost go into an apologetic position. And almost, almost think of them like people do when they're trying to protect themselves and psychologically they're really messed up. They go into a fetal position. Well, you can't find any description of a godly person like that in the scriptures. Every teaching of error stands as a challenge to the faith of you and to me if we're Christians. Every departure from a thus saith the Lord must be confronted with a soldier brandishing the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Every soldier should earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints, Jude 3. So regardless of how many leave the faith, how many apostatize, how many churches go out of existence? Our plea for the restoration of the ancient order of things as set out in the page, on the pages of the New Testament becomes the way that we operate. Now, let's say for what? Let's say we give that up. All right, where are we going to go? What are we going to use as a guide how to live life? how to get ready to meet God. When we win, put it in quotes, acceptance with the world, then we've lost our greatest battle. And yet over the years, we've seen people more and more seek acceptance to the nations, the spiritual nations around about them. The religious world may not accept our position, but it must be made to respect it. And there was a time when that was the case. And again, we throw out the challenge. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Calling Bible things by Bible names. and Doing Bible things in Bible ways. And that is the way that is right and cannot be wrong. Never should the Lord's church be guilty of offering apology. Any individual one of us or the church as a whole for direct, frank, candid, straightforward preaching and teaching of the pure gospel of Christ on any topic. Never should there be any kind of apology, saying I'm sorry, in other words, for staunchly defending the truth of God's word. The truth for which our Savior died. And we must build up the militancy the aggressiveness as Jesus had, as Paul and Stephen had. Would you like to take Stephen aside and I tell him, now Stephen, if you just toned it down, you wouldn't have got stoned to death. A person with a state of mind like that, going and telling someone like Stephen, you just shouldn't have called them what you called them. It's just beyond me because that means they're willing to rebuke God. And that never comes out well for the one who puts himself in that position. So we must militantly and aggressively move out to take the whole world with the gospel of Christ by living it every day in our lives, by preaching it, by teaching it, by opposing error. Now, I end the lesson by simply saying God will not accept anything but that. So I suggest when you're reading your Bible and your daily devotions that you notice the militancy of the brethren in the first century. Notice Paul is always on the go to confront error to save a soul. So I don't really think, and that's another sermon, that we really have the view of the importance of a human soul like they did. 
Because it's only the truth can set a man free. Gospel truth, John 8, 31 and 32. Nothing else can, and if you dilute it, it doesn't work. So if anything, we are to stand up for what's right by living it, by proclaiming it, and defending it. If you're not a child of God today, we urge you to believe the gospel with all your heart. Repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30, and confess your faith in the Christ, Romans 10, 10. Complete your obedience to the gospel in becoming a Christian by being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. If as a child of God you haven't been as you ought to be, maybe your life's even brought reproach on the church that had been characteristic of godly living, then you need to repent of those sins and confess them and pray God for, for forgiveness. Thus, if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.